Well, good morning. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Paul Gruchinski. My pronouns are he, him. Uh, let me just share uh, my screen. Is that all right? Yeah? Yes. Oops. Good. Um, well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, and I also, of course, want to acknowledge uh, Joffrey Thomas. Uh, Joffrey, if you want to introduce yourself. Hi, yes, um, everyone. My name is Joffrey Thomas. My pronouns are he, him, and I'm at Cal Poly um, in California. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, my name is Paul Gratinsky. I am at the University of Greenwich, which is in London. Uh, and uh, today's talk will be about aspects around inclusion, uh, specifically LGBTQI plus inclusion within sport and exercise psychology teaching. And uh, for me, this is a really fun talk because uh, it's brought together uh, some interesting ideas across the Atlantic, so to speak. Um, Joffrey and I started uh, chatting maybe about, I want to say almost seven months ago, six, seven months ago. Um, and it wasn't even about this talk. It was about aspects of health communication and health literacy um, and what we could do kind of scratching our heads together in terms of really helping promote the way that people talk about health, uh, elements around physical activity, aspects around exercise, aspects around sport. And this is one of a couple of projects that we've been working on. Um, and this is a, a project that is very close to my heart. Uh, it's something that was born out of, I think, frustration, uh, certainly personal experience as I was going through my training within um, sport and exercise psychology. Uh, but it was really from a place of what else can be done? How do we channel that kind of frustration and that kind of perhaps invisibility of LGBTQI people within sport and exercise psychology research and, and teaching? And how do we use this as, a, as an opportunity to perhaps talk about inclusion, talk about diversity, ways around our teaching, and so that we can perhaps help individuals in, improve their own practice, think about strategies they may wish to perhaps employ later on in their careers. Um, but this is also something um, of a reflective exercise, and um, it's really uh, dependent on why are we talking so much about inclusivity uh, these days? Why is it important to include individuals within physical activity, within exercise, within sport, where perhaps individuals may not have been previously uh, as involved? Uh, why, why all this talk about diversity? Uh, and how do we even go about defining diversity? What are perhaps um, different elements of diversity that we want to embrace within our teaching, within our practice, within research, and, and ultimately how do we help convey that to students? Why now? Um, well, that is a very good question. I, I think there is uh, certainly a lot that's happening within Europe. There's certainly a lot that's happening in the UK that prompts this kind of discussion around diversity and around inclusivity, uh, certainly helping individuals acknowledge the importance of, of being active, of what physical activity does for individuals, not only with respect to their physical health, but their mental health, but perhaps most importantly, and, and not talked enough about their, their social health. And so when we're talking about inclusivity, it's about really creating opportunities for all individuals to take part in being active. How do we think about physical activity for all sorts of individuals? How do we talk about individuals who have perhaps been traditionally left out of research, who have traditionally perhaps not been able to take part in, in being active, be they in formalized or informal means. When we're talking about diversity, we're talking about more than just what the, uh, today's topic is around LGBTQI individuals. We're gonna be talking about aspects uh, around uh, race and ethnicity, ability, disability, class, geography, all sorts of aspects which in the UK have this particular term called protected characteristics. But it's around helping raise this kind of awareness, not only for students, but as well as for future practitioners and those students who also may become researchers. In a sense, how does their work continue to be rigorous, but also take into account individuals who have traditionally been left out, 
So it's within our scope as educators to think about our teaching and certainly how do we reflect on what we do and how do we perhaps reflect on what we may do in the future. When we're thinking about this kind of reflective process, it may be also necessarily to think about what we ought to be doing in conjunction with our other demands within our labor. I understand that everybody is stretched. I'm stretched. I'm sure that everyone on this call is stretched, especially when it comes to their workload. But where does this kind of practice, this kind of reflective practice within our teaching come into account? In a sense, how do we actually want to move our curriculum forward? What are we willing to do? What are we almost mandated to do? Um, and what kind of personal satisfaction do we get from that as well? Taking into consideration the kinds of obligations and kinds of conditions and constraints that we face within our own daily lives. So this is all going to be part of a much broader discussion, a chat that um, uh, Joffrey and I will have at the end, bringing in everybody into the conversation and, and their thoughts. But um, to get us going, um, where did this all start? Where This started a number of years ago for me, certainly when I was doing my educational training, and it was really a lack of representation that I noticed uh, within the curriculums that I was a part of. And as an individual who identifies as gay, this was quite difficult for me. Not only did I experience aspects around homophobia within the classroom, uh, but also I just noticed that there wasn't any kind of representation of me within the literature that I was looking at. And so the kinds of studies that I was exposed to certainly did not talk about intersectionality with respect to sexuality or gender or aspects around race or ethnicity or ability or geography or class or other protected characteristics. And in a sense, there was a really a lost opportunity in terms of creating information and creating opportunities for further reading and further acknowledgement of something that needs to be done to help individuals who have been quite marginalized with respect to their health become active. And in a sense, this kind of lack of representation that I noticed in the literature, certainly a lack of it in the classroom, this has tremendous problems. This creates all sorts of consequences for the future research that is conducted, the kind of data that is then um, uh, um, collected. And it has tremendous consequences for the kinds of interventions that may be created. In this sense, these kinds of interventions don't acknowledge the full breadth of individuals that they are researching. They certainly don't pull in, in a participatory manner, all sorts of individuals that could certainly help create more rigorous interventions. But also, in a sense, there continues to be this deficit of knowledge and deficit of action. And in a sense, this continued lack of representation and a continued lack of intervention. This kind of work for me had always been the background, uh, something that I thought about and something that I acknowledged. And it wasn't until I was well into my career that I connected with uh, Danielle Britton, who's at the University of Colorado, I believe, in their School of Public Health, that we decided to do something about this kind of lack of representation. In a sense, it was a call to action. What we did was try to bring some visibility to this topic, not only in terms of what ought to be done in terms of data collection, but also in terms of what ought to perhaps be done with respect to the way that we talk about sexuality, sexual orientation, and gender with respect to physical activity, exercise, and sport research, and what this ultimately means for the students who we interact with. In a sense, we are helping influence future researchers and future practitioners, be they in all aspects of kinesiology. So what are we actually doing for these individuals? It was the same kind of call to action that most recently helped my friend uh, Fabio Fasoli and I put together a small call to action around COVID and specifically around research agendas that concern LGBTQ individuals. And so this kind of movement that, that Daniel Burton and I started a, a number of years ago, really focused on creating comprehensive training, making sure that we are talking about diversity in the classroom, that we are perhaps looking strategically 
with, uh, within our communities for collaborative participatory research approaches so that we are working with individuals who are perhaps most affected by um, lower levels of physical activity or perhaps in um, opportunities or lack of opportunities to be active or to participate in sport. And also in terms of really trying to uh, change the way that we collect future data. Uh, so making sure that the kinds of interventions that we create take into account a full breadth of, of uh, personable, uh, personal information around the participants we're working with. And when we kind of dug a bit deeper into these comprehensive training opportunities around diversity, we were particularly mindful about really helping students become more confident and aware of various definitions, various aspects around sexual orientation and gender identity, how that impacts health, various aspects of health, be it physical, psychological, or, or social health and also just becoming aware of various aspects of, of inequities and inequalities as to what are some of these challenges that individuals are experiencing with gaining access to being active, but also in terms of what that means overall later down the line in terms of different aspects of health. And so the kinds of strategies that we talked about were really rooted within inclusive learning strategies. So making sure that there's a considerable amount of support and access to various types of information, making sure that learning is experiential. So having hands-on opportunities and working with a great deal of case studies that provide students with access to all sorts of different scenarios where they may be able to apply their information and their knowledge, and also to learn a considerable amount from that. And it's also about helping individuals become quite confident in making sure that they can approach future research opportunities or future practice in a manner that's culturally competent. So this is what we really thought about when we're thinking about uh, comprehensive um, diversity training within undergraduate and graduate education, specifically around LGBTQI and physical activity exercise and sport. Now, I want to provide some sort of examples um, that I have been actively using within my teaching that ties in these kinds of elements of inclusivity and diversity. And so the kinds of approaches that I've taken, uh, what I'll do is I'll quickly illustrate some of the things that I've done in my graduate teaching and in my undergraduate teaching, and also what that means now for having an influence on uh, training for individuals who are becoming sport and exercise psychologists. In the UK, these are accredited health professionals, so they do have to go through supervised training. So the kinds of approaches that I took uh, in terms of creating opportunities for uh, inclusivity within the classroom, there was a considerable amount of effort that went into syllabus design, making sure that there was representation in the readings, that there was uh, class content uh, and lecture material that covered a depth of, 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 of content, making sure that speakers spoke to various aspects around this kind of aspect of inclusivity, and that there were all sorts of opportunities that were presented within their assignments. So it was guided through these kinds of considerations that I started to construct the environment with which students were learning and also some of the assignments that, that they took into account. So this is just one example of a case study, for instance, that my master's students considerably uh, worked with throughout the, uh, throughout the term. And it centered around Roberta and her type of work and specifically about her relationship as well with her wife. It was important for students to gain this kind of exposure because this was actually one of the first um, uh, times that individuals were encountering, even in writing, individuals from LGBTI communities that they could acknowledge. And so we have a considerable amount of diverse students from all over the world who specifically in their student feedback said that this was the very first time they had ever seen discussions around sexuality in the classroom and specifically focused around exercise and physical activity psychology. This kind of example, this case study was also worked into some other assignments that I had and specifically students had the ability to write out a case study that focused either on Stephen or on Phil, but both individuals who presented uh, themselves as individuals who were either trans or identified as queer and individuals who had specific needs with respect to physical activity. Again, students had to take considerable steps to get to know the individuals they were working on and, and with. 
and specifically what might be done to help push forward opportunities for greater physical activity. These kinds of strategies I also used in my undergraduate teaching, talking about Michael Sams, for instance, and his journey throughout reaching or perhaps not reaching the NFL or his career within the CFL. Michael Sams was one of the first, if not the first, openly gay individual who tried to enter the NFL. But students were also encountering aspects of local or perhaps um, regular individuals who were trying to make a difference in their communities. Individuals like um, Jesse Thompson, for instance, who was an individual within Oshawa, Ontario, Canada, who took uh, his local um, hockey organization to uh, the Human Rights Tribunal for greater inclusivity within change rooms within their hockey league. So it is important to think about specific ways of, of creating this kind of diversity in the classroom and also the kind of opportunities that might present themselves with respect to further training opportunities within professional designation uh, programs. For instance, the British Association of Sports and Exercise Psychology uh, Sciences program uh, has an entire uh, suite of programs designed around uh, further education for those individuals who are training to be sport and exercise psychologists. And specifically, next week or the week thereafter, I'll be delivering a session that talks about exploring uh, equity and equality and diversity and inclusion within their practices, what that actually means for them as practitioners and what they want to do in terms of further learning. So kind of thinking about these inclusive learning opportunities, there's a lot that can be done. Um, the kinds of things that we can think about, the kinds of uh, opinions we may be able to share, the kinds of perspectives we may be able to discuss, the kinds of pedagogical frameworks we can work with. Ultimately, it's about providing students with opportunities to think about. Now, um, that calls for reflective practice and the kind of opportunities that we create in our teaching, it's something that we need to think about. And how we go about that thinking, well, there's different ways of exploring what we've taught, what that means, and also what that means in terms of going forward. I wanna throw it over to Joffrey because we do want to provide some opportunities for discussion and, and I definitely want to provide him with some opportunities for, for furthering the discussion along. Joffrey. Thank you, Paul. Um, and so Paul and I talked about having kind of a commentary where um, in our conversation, I um, shared about Stork's upcoming summit and we began talking about different ways to promote equity and physical activity promotion and thinking about some of the not talked about issues around um, feelings of safety and inclusion within sports settings. And Paul shared the variety of lesson plans to expose students to this knowledge deficit and help them think about some of the social issues or challenges that might affect their practice in developing a relationship and providing safe inclusive spaces and understanding the motivational needs and um, various constraints of people's day-to-day -day living that intersects with our identities. Um, and so I wanted to provide a comment of how I try to engage students in critical thinking as it relates to how we understand um, the rhetoric of sport. Um, oftentimes sport is presented as this pure and often magical um, experience that just promotes um, the best of people. Um, but unfortunately, oftentimes people are excluded from sport or limited in their level of participation. And so I teach in general education courses um, that is part of a state university system that has a common core to help students understand how we learn and what the social sciences can teach us. And clearly, sport and exercise psychology falls within the social sciences. And within my course on sport and gender, we tackle the issue of sexual orientation um, because they're related to how people come to understand gender at large. And so um, the courses that I teach sport and gender as an example falls within the upper division area D and some of the education objectives um, provided are one, to provide an opportunity for students to examine problems and issues from their respective discipline perspectives and two, to examine issues in their contemporary as well as historical settings in a variety of cultural contexts. The historical basis of discrimination in sport creates a number of issues, um, such as the opportunities for career mobility um, and to be able to have full inclusion in terms of change rooms, as um, Paul had mentioned. 
So being able to expose students to one ways of thinking critically about the assumptions we have when we start to develop relationships and what sport and our individuals are supposedly doing um, helps individuals become um, more critically reflective about some of how their own exposures might be shaping um, their views of sport. Um, and so I, I wanted to share that I've had a number of activities that start to approach the um, research perspective that students can start to learn through just looking at content and culture. And one example um, was um, looking at, I'm not sure if anyone watches cartoons or things like that, but it's striking how little representation we not only see in research, but we also see in pop culture media. And how when there's a lack of representation, <clears throat> individuals are encouraged to fill in their so their knowledge gap using stereotypes that they may have picked up unknowingly. And I showed my students, it was a just an activity of critical thinking, what can we do, um, how can we do that looking at media of a show called Cuphead, which is based off a video game, but there's these cups, one is like a mug and one's a cup, and they're like, they're like, kind of human uh, presenting characters, but their cartoons because their heads are really cups filled with stuff. And for some reason, it doesn't fall out. But they're, as soon as their guardian leaves to get his um, periodic mustache shaving, um, they start roughhousing and playing around, um, destroying things except the radio because that's the most prized possession of their adult guardian. And they ask themselves, why are we roughhousing? Why are we doing this? And this, the question was, because we were told not to. And so the reader is seeing that these both present as masculine, stereotypical boys and are this implicit assumption of how boys are supposed to act in their physical expressions and competitive drives. And then for some reason, a baby appears in their door and they fall into stereotypical gender roles. As soon as the baby calls one of the cups mama, the baby takes on a stereotypical caring and nurturing role and for some reason shuns roughhouse behavior while the other boy seems to automatically become inept in understanding how to deal with and develop relationships with that young child. And so we can kind of see implicit in that is this issue called heteronormativity that makes it seem oppositional sexual attractions are the default and natural way of interacting in the world. And filled with that is misinformation about what people are supposedly able to do when it comes to caring and developing relationships. For some reason, femininity is associated with its inherent ability to understand, nurture, and care, whereas masculinity is devoid of that and proclivitous um, or inclined to roughhousing, um, unethical, or disregarding behavior. So in my own classes, I've had an opportunity to allow students to use content analysis and other research methods to interrogate culture. And we can kind of see very similarly, um, they both provide an opportunity for one, for students to recognize a lack of exposure and to start to think about some of the issues that that might make it difficult for exercise research to develop strategies around addressing. For example, in the US, uh, many of us have heard of the anti-trans laws that are being pushed in a variety of US states, 20 of, or three of which have already exacted laws um, barring transgender students um, at the high school level from participating in um, sport consistent with their gender identity. And we see oftentimes a pushing of misinformation about this inherent supposed advantage, biological advantage to gender, though within this exercise psychology domain, we understand that psychology, particularly anxiety management and attention strongly influences one risk of injury, uh, performance maintenance and performance development. So we see with the lack of representation, individuals are culturally being encouraged to continue to fill in the gaps with misinformation and stereotyping. And so one of the things that this can help us do as researchers is one to think about some of the issues that, again, gets back at this historical exclusion and some of the challenges people face in their daily lives as it relates to orientation and identity. And my, I want to end with some work that my students have done, trying to ask the question, well, following this exposure, where do we go from here? And my students have identified a number of resources that has helped them understand more so and become more interested in the lived experiences of people in sport, um, including um, finding an international study looking at the lived experiences of LGBTI participants and provided 
a infographic, uh, which was incredible. Um, and one of the things that's shown in an infographic is that sport historically um, conservative in terms of maintaining discriminatory and stereotyping beliefs. Um, a number of school surveys say that while their broader school environment seems to be more inclusive, they have more role models in sport, individuals don't feel safe if they disclose their sexual identity or their trans identity. Um, and so we see that by providing students an opportunity to understand some of the issues around a lack of representation, it can start to help them appreciate the need to have or to explore diverse ways of understanding sport. Um, and so with that, I'm really excited um, by this topic because it um, provides an opportunity to continue to think me thinking of how I can enhance my teaching of serving individuals who are not necessarily pursuing kinesiology majors, but um, are trying to better understand what the social sciences and disciplines that kinesiology contributes to can help them understand about their everyday environments and broader issues that hit the headlines. Um, and so with that, I'd like to um, turn it back over to um, Paul. Well, I, I think this is where we get into the discussion portion and um, and open up the floor to any questions within the time that we have available. Um, I think one of the first questions that that has been posed within the chat is is why this kind of aspect of underrepresentation in health research. Um, it, it the kind of work that that I've certainly referred to is uh, is rooted within a lot of the research reports that have come out of ILGA uh, and specifically the kind of work that's been done on discrimination and, and lack of representation stemming from um, individuals just being excluded on account of uh, aspects around homophobia, biphobia and transphobia. But it also um, is something that has been an issue within the profession of, of, of academia. Uh, there's been recent reports that have come out of nature within the last year or so that talked about the kinds of challenges that individuals who are uh, LGBTQI uh, within the academy also experience greater aspects of, of mental health and physical health, uh, work stress, uh, social exclusion, um, and also opportunities for perhaps not advancing. So this is something that... Um, is, is greatly tied to individuals facing all sorts of obstacles in their lives, um, not only in terms of their careers, but also perhaps wanting to then not talk about some of these aspects within the research. Uh, in a sense, wanting to almost perpetuate for safety aspects around lack of representation. So this is something that has been ignored for a considerable amount of time. This is not something that is a relatively new phenomenon but there are attempts that are being made to ensure that data is collected on, um, on a number of different protected characteristics, sexual orientation and gender identity, just being two of those aspects. Uh, Joffrey, I'm not sure if you wanted to throw in anything on that. Yeah, um, one of the things, um, I think it gets back to our broader culture exposure, out of sight, out of mind. Um, and so oftentimes mm -hmm. policies are put into place that see sport and particularly for activity in a very narrowly defined way of just getting people moving and not necessarily examining the cultural aspect of interest and abilities. Um, and so uh, kind of circling back, it could be a limited opportunity for individuals to kind of un to examine how stereotypes or expectations of how they should perform in sport um, might shape kind of their narrow lens of sport. Um, and so limited opportunities for folks to be, to shown um, one, that there is a disparity in participation and that might be linked to, and how that might be linked to stereotypes or fears of participating based off of identity. And then think, tracing back to our own experiences as individuals develop a sense of awareness around these issues and how they might have unknowingly not attended to them, um, individuals enter roles of authority and leadership that perpetuate um, a, a normative culture that sees sport in a very narrowized way and in a glorified way as the solution. For example, obesity, even though movement is more indicative of health risk than body mass, um, obesity is the number one funded um, intervention on flexibility rather than uh, promoting the cultural value of sport 
and encouraging individuals with diverse body forms um, to move and to learn how to move well. In the US, we have an underfunding of physical education. We have a commercialization of youth sport. Um, and we have this rhetoric of obesity as the number one reason to get people moving, even though the research doesn't suggest that that should be the goal. So it comes back to a limited opportunity for individuals to examine some of these disparities and thinking about how they are tied to the culture, um, and then entering roles that continue to push or normalize a very narrow way of thinking and promoting sport. It is what I've seen um, from um, my um, approach to more the culture aspect of it. Mm. This certainly creates opportunities for, for a great deal of exploration within policy. I know that we're running over on time, but I just want to leave you with one example that's uh, being taken right now within the UK and, and specifically in the Women in Equalities Committee. And that is looking at strategies to help improve data collection. And part of the inquiries that they have launched as a committee has exposed just that, that individuals who identify as LGBTQ are, are facing a great deal of, of health inequity. And so creating opportunities within parliament to actually launch inquiries into data collection strategies and address some of these aspects around representation are starting to happen here. Um, but I know that we're about three minutes over already, four, five almost. Um, and so uh, I just wanted to ask if there's any any last questions before we, because I know I don't want to uh, cut in on the next speaker's time. Um, don't worry, that's me. I'm like, I, okay. I'm on your time. We, You're fine. Well, um, Jeffrey, one more question, then we'll call it. Sure, yes. Um, it, there's a question that asks, if I can read it, that says, given that in closing of the identity of LGBTQIA plus people in sport as well as sports science always bears a risk of violence and there are any, are there any best practices in navigating inclusion, diversity, and as well as safety? And I was gonna mention that Vicki Crane um, wrote a chapter in um, Ellen Stowski's textbook, Women in Sport, Continuing the Journey of Liberation and celebration ends with a number of important steps that role models and, and coaches um, and team leaders can take to normalize discussing of diverse orientations and taking a firm stance against bigotry type behaviors. Um, and so there has been a listing that tries to one model a expect a value of inclusion and to use one's position as a leader within a group to help model how to engage with um, um, discrimination and to speak openly about issues around violence that takes place in the community. One of the things that we see um, related to this is that as individuals speak out, there the feelings of safety increases um, and that there are policies that educators can use to um, hold folks to account when they engage in discriminatory or violent type behaviors. Um, and so, um, leveraging that can help create a buffer, um, but certainly it requires leaders and those who are becoming more educated to understand the role of culture and to become aware of policies that are meant to hold folks to account when they transgress onto people's um, right to safety. Certainly raising awareness, creating opportunities for education, making sure that there is, uh, oh, uh, making sure there's a mechanism of, of reporting um, potential discrimination or harassment or aspects around violence, making sure that individuals have those kinds of mechanisms in place all create opportunities for, for safety. So making sure that we are providing all sorts of opportunities for educational um, uh, opportunities within our students or for our students, making sure that uh, within the profession of sport and exercise psychology specifically, the practitioners are aware of these kinds of um, issues as well, making sure that we're talking about diversity and strategies for greater inclusion within sport, and making sure that furthering good rigorous research is collecting data on this. So this is not continuing to be an invisible topic. By creating opportunities for greater representation, we can continue this con conversation and also ensuring that we're taking steps in terms of participatory research, make sure that any kind of solution is one that comes from the communities which are most greatly affected. So um, we are seven minutes over. <laughs> I feel 
seven minutes more guilty uh, about taking more time. But certainly I wanna thank um, the organizers of Stork for, for having me um, and, and for creating space for this important discussion, especially around Pride Month as well. So thank you, thank you for having me.